Hello and welcome to MCM's Montgomery Talks, where we discuss all things Montgomery County. I'm your host, senior reporter Doug Tolman. We're recording this episode of Montgomery Talks during Black History Month, so it's apropos that, we, that with me today is Natalie Williams, historian for the Sandy Springs Slave Museum and an expert on the deep roots of black history in Montgomery County. Welcome, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Um, first, let's talk about the museum itself. It's a historical museum, and let's start with the museum's history. When was it founded? It was founded about 30 years ago by Dr. Winston Anderson, and uh, Dr. Anderson had a vision to develop a place for people to come and visit. At first, it was a, a petting farm, actually, but eventually it turned into where, since he has a background, he's like an, he's a professor, he's a retired professor at Howard University in biology department, but he also is very, uh, is traveled a lot throughout Africa and um, diaspora, the diaspora, and he has collected a lot of different different artifacts. So once the building was erected, the vision was to bring the, the history of African Americans and, well, African people to Sandy Spring or to Montgomery County. So um, it's, been, it's been here for a while, and it's growing, and we are, um, you know, open, and it's a, it's a place where people can pretty much touch history um, because we are very, um, you have so many different things where you can walk around and you can see things and we explain things to you and people can pick things up. So it's 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 been a very, I would say, a, a place where you can just really learn and continue to grow more about African American people here in Montgomery County. Okay. So how did it start? I mean, it, you, you talked about the founder, but I mean, in terms of it must have taken money, it must have taken a lot of blood and sweat and tears to try and... Um, it, yes. I mean, this is all, pri- it's all private. It's not a, we're a nonprofit group, so it's been a lot of people within Sandy Spring who help support it. George and Georgina Campbell, actually Mr. Campbell just passed away. He was like 100 years old just a couple of months ago. He was one of the key people, along with some other key folks from Sandy Spring who helped support um, and, you know, with, with monies to help build. And Mr. Dr. Anderson put a lot into it himself to build the museum. So that's how it really just came apart. It was a, quite a few families that was definitely working with Dr. Anderson and we just came together as a community and thought that this was something we really needed to have. So we, with the support of the community, that's how it really started growing from, from different monies that we raised. And how long have you been with the museum? I actually have been with the museum about, it's almost, believe it or not, I would say eight, nine months. But I have been connected with the museum since it's been built. My father, he's, you know, been, he, he doesn't serve on any board or anything, but I have been connected to it with quite a few of the people that are connected uh, with the board members. Um, I just haven't. Finally, I'm able to really just get more involved with the museum. I've worked with Dr. Anderson before on a few things, but, you know, not really to the point where I was working as much as I am now volunteering. Okay. You're a 501c3. So where does your funding come from? Is it mostly just people paying to come to see it? or Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So what's the significance of the Sandy Spring location for this museum? The significance is Sandy Spring was an, one of the free black settlements for African Americans in Maryland. So the Quakers, they settled the area first um, in about like 17, in the 1700s, 1720s. And so they, what they, they came, they settled the land. They actually, quite a few of the larger Quaker owners had, did have slaves, but uh, pretty soon around 1770, the uh, larger Quaker religion pretty much, you know, made it mandated that, you know, all our Quaker members should, uh, they didn't, they didn't believe in still holding people in bondage. So they wanted all their members to free the, um, any people that they had as, as enslaved people. So this, many of the Quakers in Sandy Spring did free their enslaved folks by 1820, 20s, between the 20s and the latest was actually 1840. So that's rather significant, you know, considering African-American folks weren't freed from until 1865 throughout the country. So um, this was a huge thing because it was such a, an area then that became a free black settlement. And you had free blacks living beside here in Montgomery County, other owners who did have enslaved people on their property. Property. So you had slaves and, and free people living in the same area. But it was like an oasis in, a, in an area where you had slavery. Wow, okay. And, and you have a number of uh, artifacts that you've uncovered. Oh, yes. Can, can you describe some of them? Um, so, so many. Let's see. Uh, yes. Some of the artifacts that... Um, 
we have different, a couple different things. One, many of the artifacts uh, come from Africa, okay? So many, quite a few from Africa. But when we move throughout our museum, because we have different areas, that's one particular room. When we move into the Jim Crow room, we have tons of art artifacts from uh, shackles and branding iron. And then we move into some of the pictures of uh, during the Jim Crow era of um, people in blackface and people, the the advertisements of tobacco. So you'd see different pictures of how, you know, you can see, unfortunately, it's showing the negative stereotype, typical type of thing of black people, but we have some of those. Then we move into the family or community room, which is more specific to just Sandy Spring, and we have quite a few things in there from different pictures and different items that people did donate to the museum, you know, different African-American families that donated maybe some china, maybe maybe some other little items, photographs, photo books, things of that nature. We have a barber's chair um, from one of the fam one of the members who was a who was a barber, some blacksmith tools, you know, things of that nature, other farming implements. So it's quite a few different things that we've from the area that people actually donated to the museum. Hmm. Amazing. Be because of its history, I assume there are still a number of families that can oh, trace yes. their, their histories back to the 1820s and 1840s. Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, there's quite a few families that still connect to the um, the many of the enslaved people that were freed. So my family, for one, I can go back at least five generations, which is pretty unique for most African-American people because when you're doing like genealogy, for example, and you try to research, you can use your census and get back to um, like 1870. You'll see a lot of people. But before that, it's very hard to find black folks unless they were freed. And you can do that in Sandy Spring if you have some connection to people. So it's many, many families um, that still reside in Montgomery County today that are connected. It's, it's like Sandy Spring was the, the beginning, and people just sprouted from there and went to different areas of the county mm -hmm. or the state. So what part did the, did the families in Sandy Spring play in, in the, the struggle for African Americans and, and freedom? They, oh, it was many different ways, starting from the beginning. At the beginning, I would say, well, once people were freed, they were many people set up um, little, their homes, their homesteads, and a lot of those homes became stations along the Underground Railroad. That's the beginning. So we do have some stories of people who were, yeah, one person was George Enoch Howard. He was one of the first um, uh, wealthiest black men in the county. So he was known from what we have researched to help people and, and provide shelter. Um, and there's some other people who, uh, Remus Hill was another person and some other ones who helped along the way. With, with providing shelter or, or money or food or whatever. And then after, so after, I would say after um, slavery and then emancipation, you also had where some of the first black schools and you had a first black Sharp Street United Methodist Church here in the county. Uh, it was a you know, free church. So these these two things, along with all these people coming and going to these different places, they, they were able to you know find some strength, to find some um, support for the different things that they needed to do throughout their daily lives. And it just continued to grow from there. Um, you had um, a Negro League baseball team in the area at that time. Um, the Sandy Spring uh, baseball team is a Negro League team. And actually one of the members, he was, well, he was much younger, Russell Awkward. He eventually ended up playing in a Negro League team. But Sandy Spring was one of the, they had a smaller, like, you know, farm team. And, and you had different things that keep moving up forward that has impacted you know, Montgomery County in general. Do Montgomery County schools teach black history enough? Do you think? I would say not as much as I think they would they should. They could do more. I do know that within the eighth grade curriculum, they talk about United States history. So that's when they may they may receive something. And if they do, it may be something that they might learn about. But I don't know how much. And throughout, you know, the curriculum for history or even just in general. And I really think it comes down to the schools, you know, how much they actually want to highlight different things about African-American history. But I do think that it should be more because students do not are just not aware of what has occurred here in this county and the different things that are very important for them to, to know it could be it could be more what are say elements outside of Sandy Spring of of Montgomery County's role in in ending slavery 
Well, the main thing with outside of Sandy Spring, you had some, um, you did have a lot of people here since it was both Confederate and Union folks here in the county. The people who supported the Union, you had a lot of support. You know, you had a lot of people who were abolitionists. So throughout the whole state, but definitely within this county, um, I would say that those were pretty big elements to really help because they were all over. You had people as far as um, down like towards Bethesda and you had you had many different things happening as far as uh, west towards uh, Poolsville. So you have you have different different elements that have come together to try to really help end slavery. It's just I guess you just had the different pockets where you had more support. And it just seemed like the majority of the support centered around Sandy Spring just because of probably the Quakers. Is that true statewide? Um, I mean, we often hear about uh, Harriet Tubman on the Eastern Shore. Oh, yes. You know, Frederick Douglass and whatnot. Right. But, but I mean, how does, say, Montgomery County fit in, like, the larger statewide It's effort? It's pretty significant, actually, with Montgomery County because of Montgomery County and Harrow County. Well, they're, well, since we're next to, you know, neighbors, th- with the, and you also had within Baltimore, you had, you know, quite a few people who were connected to helping the whole cause. And, you know, so it was a whole committee of people or a whole group of people. And most of the time it worked in secret if they were really helping along the Underground Railroad. But throughout the state, you had key areas. Sandy Spring was just one. But, yes, you did have places in Baltimore, within Baltimore City. You also had some maybe some places in Harrah County. You may have some things with through the southern, southern part of the county, but you had that's usually with a larger slave plantation were in the south and on the eastern shore. I mean, you still had some support, but most of it seemed to center on this side of the Bay mm-hmm. Bridge, <laughs> right. all the way towards Baltimore and then above Baltimore because they would get to York, Pennsylvania, and then move on up to Philadelphia. Right. How, how does Sandy Spring compare to, say, the oldest African-American settlement in Maryland? Is is it one of the older ones? Is it? It's, it's the, uh, as far as I have researched, it's the, the oldest one. It should be the oldest one from what I was researching because it was one of the oldest, the first free settlements. Mm-hmm. So you had many settlements that popped up after that, but the, it was the first free one because this was, once again, 1820. And uh, you did have other places throughout Maryland. I haven't researched as many different places in Maryland. You had different things happening, but Sandy Spring, that's why Sandy Spring is so unique. And they also were the first place in to have the first free, free the, they had freed a group of slaves. Slaves. It was the first large group of freeing of slaves in Sandy Spring that happened in the state of Maryland. It was happened in Sandy Spring. And that was in 1820 when it was about close to 60 slaves ri- that were freed by Richard Thomas, who was a Quaker from Sandy Spring. So that was pretty significant, you know, that you had a huge, large group of people being freed at one time. Mm. Okay, well, we're about at the time where we're going to take a quick break. This is Doug Tallman, senior reporter at MCM. I'm speaking with Natalie Williams, the historian at the Setting Spring Slave Museum. We'll be right back. MCM, your community media center, is making Montgomery County a great place to live through programs like 21 This Week. Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show keeps you up to date with the local political scene. Montgomery Community Media. Our middle name is Community. And we're back, and we're talking with Natalie Williams, historian at the Sandy Spring Slave Museum. We often hear about Harriet Tubman and mm, and, yes. and Frederick Douglass as far as Marylanders in, in black history. Mm-hmm. Who are the names that we should know that we don't? Right. Well, one is Josiah Henson, and Josiah Henson was, he was actually born a slave in, in, in Maryland. He, what eventually happened is he was sold to a man named Isaac Riley, who lived right here in, um, in Bethesda area. And so he was here in Montgomery County. And what's really significant about him is that Josiah, he worked very hard on Isaac Riley's plantation, but he became like sort of the foreman. He, they didn't usually use the word overseer for him, but it, it was similar to that. You know, people know what an overseer, what their position was. So, but, so he had other slaves. Uh, there were other slaves on the plantation and he was there in charge of them. And so what eventually happened is, you know, he was married and had children. He, Mr. Riley came into a point where he was, you know, had some problem with his money and finances. So he had a brother in Kentucky. And so he wanted to then send his, all his people, all his property to his brother in Kentucky. And so he entrusted Josiah to do this. So Josiah, you know, and all of the people, his family included, they leave here, Maryland, 
and go to Kentucky. However, on the way, you know, they passed through like <laughs> Ohio and a lot of the freed people there were, were saying, why are you, you know, you can just run now. You can go towards Canada. You know, why continue on to Kentucky and continue to keep all the rest of these people? You, know, you guys are still going to be in bondage. You know, why do that? He had a sense of like a purpose where, no, he entrusted me with everyone and I'm going to, you know, see this job through. Plus, in his mind, he was going to he work to try to make a little bit of money to free his family. So once he gets to Kentucky, he, he delivers everybody safely. He tried to work. He worked with his um, the brother, uh, Mr. Riley's brother, and he was trying to he gave him some money to, to put aside, you know, so he can free his family. But Mr. Riley basically gave him a raw deal. He and his brother, they kind of act. They, they took the money, of course, unfortunately. And then they said, oh, no, you know, this is not enough. You know, and they kept they kept stalling it out where he was becoming frustrated, like, OK, you know what? They're not going to keep their end of the deal where I can free, have my family freed and myself be free. So then he did run away and he went to Canada. And then he started, you know, the, the settlement that was begun. He lived there. But eventually he hooks up with, at some point, with a very important lady named Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. So he had written, he was, he has his own autobiography. Right. So and he she, knows Beecher Stowe. Yes. Okay. And so she bases her Uncle Tom on Josiah. That, so that's a key piece there. People are like, wow, you know. And of course, that book was just very important uh, right in 1860 when the war is beginning. And I think that's one of the key things, at least a lot of historians have said, to, to put in the minds of many of Americans about, you know, the condition of slavery and people trying to escape and, and you know, um, having this, this, you know, for people to be free. So he was a key part of that. Now, he eventually became a minister. Um, he did travel back to Maryland and to Sandy Springs specifically because he was in that area. He actually had another connection with another family of two brothers, William Holland and John Holland. And they are part of the Holland family. That's a huge name, along with Howard here in Montgomery County. And um, their mother's name was Letha. What happened to two of them, they want, they needed, wanted to escape because they were learning that they were going to be sold. So they eventually did escape Sandy Spring area. So one left before the other. And he was, if so, it was probably a good couple years in between. And they didn't know if he arrived until Josiah happened to come back to Sandy Spring and let the family know. I saw, I saw William. He's doing well. He has a farm. He's, you know, has, has, pl he's growing things. And so they were excited to know that he made it. And then the other brother eventually escaped. And so that side of the family lives in Canada. And then I think probably more than 20 years ago or more. I'm not connected to that particular family, but I think it's 20 years or more. The families have reconnected again, the people from Sandy Spring or from Maryland and the people from Canada, and they have family reunions like every couple of years. And it's like a whole, it's, I don't even know the number. It's so many people um, from what I understand, and they love it, and it's a good thing. They come together every couple of years to celebrate. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this during Black History Month, and we had Valerie Irvin on the podcast, mm -hmm. and we asked her about the importance of Black History Month. And she gave this this, this fantastic story I, I, of how important it was to her because it, it, it evoked memories of her father and what he went through during World War II. Why is Black History Month important to you? I would say it's important mainly because it helps other people and, and for people who do not know to learn about the contributions and the different things that people have, you know, have contributed to our society because a lot of times that just goes unseen. And when I think about it, um, I can think back to being a younger person, you know, growing up in Sandy Spring and going through Montgomery County Public Schools because I went through Montgomery County Public Schools. I didn't learn, I didn't learn about black history at all, you know, very rarely except for maybe like Harriet Tubman. And so I felt that, you know, coming th up as a young person, I felt like I didn't see enough people who represented me and, and or at least know their story, you know, at least know what they may have gone through. And and that was all the way through from elementary through through high school. Maybe maybe when I got to high school, it could have been something that I may have read, but it wasn't enough. And then I've so I've never really stuck with me. And I really and I really believe that's why people need to see because we have with our communities being so diverse as they are, people need to see and understand what everyone has done to help contribute to um, the society, you know, there's so many different ways from, you know, anything to do with education to science to engineering to sports or whatever it may be. It's something that's just invaluable. And I know I wish I had something more of that when I was younger. I just didn't. And not until I was actually probably in college is when I received a whole lot more any information about African American history except for just truly the basics. What drew you to history? Actually, it was my father, he always seems to, um, he enjoys history. And one thing that we used to do a lot when I was younger was we used to go camping. We had a 
like a, a trailer that you, you, know, you pull up, pull along with the truck. And we used to go camping as a young girl. And that was a pretty interesting experience because you didn't see many black families doing a lot of camping. But we had a, it was a group of us. And so we would go to places usually pretty close, meaning like we went to Virginia, but not maybe in Northern Virginia. So we used to go, to, for example, to Bull Run State Park. And I just fell in love with, like, wow, these people are dressing up. Why are they dressing up, you know, in these hot clothing? And they have these little rifle things. And, you know, they actually are making noise. And I was a little girl, you know, listening and watching a reenactment of the Battle of Bull Run. And my father was, you know, telling me, uh, you know, what he knew a little bit about Union and Confederacy and whatnot. And that just really kind of like, wow, this is, people actually try to relive this to kind of, you know, give a picture. And I thought that was really, you know, it just stuck with me. And so that's where I really began to just start appreciating that there's history in different places that sometimes people just have to uncover. And so that's where it really started. And then I eventually, of course, went to school and studied history. Uh, Amazing. Okay. You've got four missions, or, or uh, your missions divide up into four sections that uh, I noticed on your website to focus and to bridge and to highlight and display. Can you, can you talk about what the museum does to do those kinds of things? Oh, yes. Yeah. So many, many things that we do. We will have, of course, people will come to visit and just come through the museum. But we like to work with any groups, you know, student groups or church groups, any groups that want to come in. And we will work with them and take them through because we want to help them understand the whole journey from where folks have begun as they were free people in Africa and then spread out throughout the, throughout the world, basically. But once they got here to America, what it was like for them. So we're able to to try to help people understand and bridge that 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 connection and it might be you know, they might not know that there's really a, a huge connection from the continent to here and how so many things from the simple thing as the banjo that was that's an African in, instrument and we have an we have an African banjo in the museum and so we let somebody you'll let them hold it you know it's like well and it just it sounds like a banjo <laughs> then we have a banjo you know and then we say well you see how this particular instrument was you know it, someone, you know, was on a ship, came over here, made this instrument. You know, it's something that they were used to. And But it, of course, has evolved into something totally, you know, something else, which is good and something that people use. So those are types of things that we want to make those connections. But working with groups, always working with groups, we have sometimes have little classes for, you know, for people, um, work with homeschool students, um, whoever wants to really reach out and say, I would like to have an experience. And sometimes some people just say, I would like to come because I don't know enough about this particular, whatever it may be. It could be something about Africa. It could be something about Jim Crow Jim Crow during America. And we can just try to, we'll focus and try to make it more individualized. And then on top of what we also, we want to bring it, reach out to the community by having speaker series. So we've had people talk about everything from genetics and and uh, then something about men's health, specifically African-American men's health, to my presentation, which was the Underground Railroad, to other things about like financial literacy. So we're trying to do different things, um, and we're looking forward to even doing things more with like um, our county, the Montgomery County Public Schools, with teachers and teaching them more about maybe hopefully putting more things in the curriculum, for example. Um, So those are things that we're trying to, we do so many different things, but those are different examples. And people, people can just drive up to your museum and walk around, or they can groups can come as well. Yes. Now the we are open on weekends, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, and we open right now one day a week on Thursdays since we're run by volu- you know all volunteers. So, but people usually contact us through them, you know our website, and so then if they want a you know a tour, you know, we just put the information out, and then you know one of our volunteers are uh, more than willing to to set up a tour, you know, when it's convenient with that group, and that might be on a different day, which is fine. But yes, because there are outside things that you can see that are, you know, we have some buildings and some structures outside that um, an actual African hut, a slave ship, replica of a slave ship, and a few other things so people can see those items outside. Okay. You often hear about how the importance of education for for any group, but it sounds like your mission is to to educate folks about yes. something that isn't well uh, yes, that, understood. Yes, that that is the mission is to definitely educate. You know, to to make sure people understand and know uh, the different things that, that African American people have been able to do and what they're continuing to do to support you know the America and to support the different things. So it's and it's really um, it's a lot there. It's it's the type of place where once you go. If you come back the next time you see something different, you're like, wow, I didn't see that. Because we have just a lot of different things, which is really makes it fun because it's like, okay, I get a different experience each time I come. Mm-hmm. So that makes it special also. OK. 
Okay. So since this is Black History Month, mm -hmm. how can you take the spirit of Black History Month and make it last all year long? I would say the main thing about doing, take it, I would do by sharing our experiences, you know, being able to talk to people and taking that spirit of just enthusiasm of, you know, let, you know, let's try to understand that, that things, let's look at what the big picture may be. It's many people that have impacted so many different areas in our, in our society today. So I think just by being excited about it and going out and just sharing with people what we know is helpful. I think that is um, one way to keep it is just to, just to say, you know, there's something else that you can look at. You know, there's something else that there's sometimes a different perspective or a different, different way of how something came into being. And, and let me share this with you, that type of thing. You know, did you realize that a particular person invented invented a particular device or something like that. And they say, well, you did you know that person was African-American. You know, you can just, different things like that. That's what I try to do every day with things um, when I work with kids at school. You know, I try to, you know, incorporate different things and let kids know, you know, there's different people that have done different things and contributed to our, you know, to, to so many things that you just have to start sharing. I really do believe that's a big part. Hmm. Okay, well, it's about time to wrap things up. But before we leave, could we have the address for the museum? It is 18524 Brook Road, Sandy Spring, Maryland. Okay, so you can plug that into Waze and find your way there. Yes. And you're open when? We're open on Thursdays, and that is from like 12 to 2, and then we're, work, we're open on Saturday. And the times from that are it's like 10 to 4, and then on Sundays, 12 to 4 also. Your admission price is? Ten. Okay. Dollars. Ten dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Williams, for being with us. Mm -hmm. This has been Montgomery Talks. I'm Doug Tallman, senior reporter with Montgomery Community Media. Our engineer today has been Mike Valentine. And please join us next time when we're on Montgomery Talks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.